In this video, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how the idea of superposition comes in to help us build a model of the magnetic field due to a wire that's carrying some amount of current. So going back to this picture of a wire here, um, if we think about a single charge moving in that wire um, with some velocity V1 and it has some charge Q1, um, it will produce a magnetic field uh, at the location of this point um, that points out of the board, right? So we'll have some magnetic field produced by that piece. If we look at another piece of charge moving with a velocity V2, um, and it has a charge Q2, and it has a relative position vector R2, it also produces a magnetic field that points out of the board. If you use the right hand rule, point your fingers in the direction of V, curl in the direction of R. It's a positive charge, for example, in this case, let's say. So they all point out of the board. Third charge, V3, has a positive Q3, have a relative position vector R3, and it produces a magnetic field that points out of the board. Now all those drawings that I just made here should all sort of lie on the same point, and they all add up to give you the net magnetic field, right? The point being that if we look at the total magnetic field that's produced at any point in time, that is going to be equal to mu naught over 4 pi times the quantity Q1, V1, cross R1 hat over R1 squared plus Q2, V2 times R2 hat over R2 squared plus all the other terms that we have. Right. So the idea is that we can add up all of these guys. This is what the superposition principle tells us. It's why it's so powerful. Um, to get that the total magnetic field is equal to mu naught over 4 pi times the sum of all the individual contributions by the individual charges that are running along that wire. So where the power comes in is when we use this to build a model for the wire where you have a steady current running through it. And the idea here is that if we think about adding up all those charges, um, we will be able to generate a magnetic field. Now, the model itself that we have for this is that all the Qs are the same. That is, the charge carriers are all the same kind of thing. And that they all move with the same velocity namely the drift speed. Now we know that inside of the wire, the uh, charges are accelerating and they're bumping into each other and so forth, but the model that we build suggests that the charges and the velocities are all going to be r roughly the same. And so the magnetic field that we will generate that is associated with that is going to have a slightly simpler description, namely that the sum is now only over the relative positions of the charges, right? So in this case where we had Q1, Q2, Q3, V1, V2, V3, in fact what we have is Q, V, Q, V, Q, V, and the only thing that's different is where they are on the, on the, um, in the wire, okay? What this allows us to do is to think about um, uh, a section of the wire that has a whole bunch of charge moving in it, and we can treat that as a current and we can think about adding this up in a continuous fashion, just like we did when we were talking about um, the way that we would get from moving single charges to a current. So we're going to dispense with this idea for a moment. And we're going to say instead what we have is some current that moves along the wire. And we'll cut up a little piece of that wire to have some thickness DL. Now, if the charges themselves uh, are moving with a speed V, then we can relate that speed V and the amount of charge to the current and this sort of space. The way we do that is by thinking of a continuous chunk of charge moving. So taking this idea and making it a little chunk of charge DQ that we then integrate over. So the idea is that we are now saying that we have a sort of continuous stream of charge, if you will, um, that we're going to add up using an integral along this line. And now these positions are with respect to some arbitrary choice of charge that moves along in, in this situation. So what we'll deal with is we'll, we'll sort of have to deal with this V because we can't really add up the charge. What we have to do is sort of add up in spatial coordinates. We have to think about the physical space in which we're adding across. So the way to do that is to think about if we had this chunk here moving with a speed v, um, 
what does that mean in terms of the, the velocity? So this little chunk here will move in, an, in a time dt at the speed v. The idea being that we track this chunk over some short period of time, and that's equal to this instantaneous velocity that we're keeping track of, which everybody moves with the same speed. So what that tells us is that this idea of um, the charge moving along uh, to the right here can be modeled in terms of a current because what we can do is we can transfer that little amount dt to the little amount dq. So let's see how that works. So the thing upstairs is dq times v. And what we're suggesting is that this dl is actually a vector dl that points in the direction that the current is going. And so in this case, we're going to have a dq times dl dt. We can transfer the dt to the dq. And don't tell your math professors that we did this, because they'll be upset with us. But the idea is that the amount of charge that moves at a speed v is the same as the amount of current that goes through a distance dl. Those are the same kind of physical quantities. And in fact, they're exactly the same amount. So ultimately, what we end up with is the total current times dl. That's what we can replace this with. So our model for the magnetic field for a wire like this is mu naught over 4 pi times this integral IDL cross r hat over r squared. Now, let's make sure we understand all the parts here. So mu naught over 4 pi is a constant. I is whatever this current is. DL is the little sliver that we are tracking um, that points in the direction of the current. And so r is the vector that points from that little sliver to the location that we care about finding the magnetic field at. So what we're doing is we're actually adding up all the contributions to all these little slivers as we move along instead of individual charges. Um, now, this is, a, this is a pretty sophisticated way of doing this calculation. Um, it has a special name. It's called the Biot-Savar Law. Um, And it's a way of adding up all of the pieces of the magnetic field contributed by every little piece of current. Now there's an example in the notes that goes into detail into how you actually calculate this. And I would recommend going through that in some detail um, because it makes use of this idea of the Biot-Savar law. Uh, the net result is that the magnetic field for a very, very long wire is something like mu naught over 2 pi i over s, where s is the distance between the center of the wire and the location that you care about. So something like that. That's a really common result that we're going to, to be able to use when we have really long wires. So it's one worth quoting. But I would recommend that you go through the notes and actually look through this in detail to see how it's calculated. So in this video, all we've done is basically apply the principle of superposition, um, but really decided to build a model of how the charge moves through a piece of wire to recover the Biot-Savar law. And in the notes, there's an application that shows you how to get it for a really long wire.